Okay, I think everyone is here. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with the composer reading portion of this webinar. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, it's been a really great pleasure to see you all and to be sort of talk, spending the day talking about contemporary organ music. Um, I'm on the panel here with uh, Joe Downing. Uh, Joe, if you could say hello. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't quite ready to say hello. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be back. I'm so thoroughly enjoying today's proceedings. Great. Thanks for being here. George Baker, who some of you heard from earlier, is also here. George, if you could say hello. Hey, everyone. Hi, y'all. Great. And then we also have performers, Jonathan Embry. Jonathan's hopefully here. I'm here. Yay. <laughs> Uh, Ann Laver, who you've heard from a bunch, uh, Alex Metzler, you can say hello, and Augustin Sobang. Augustin, are you here? Hi, I'm here. Great. Okay, so um, we had a great response to our call for scores. We were really happy with the pieces that we received. It was really lovely to hear so much organ music. Um, just so you have a sense of our application process, we asked composers to submit a completed work for solo organ that had not been published, and then also a sample of their best work, which didn't have to be an organ piece, just so that we could get to know them and their compositional voice. We chose four pieces for this reading session that offered a pretty broad range of styles so that we could talk about a wide variety of things related to writing for the organ. I'm gonna introduce each composer, give you a little biographical information about them. They'll get to say hello, so you see them in the Zoom box. And then I'm gonna play a recording that was made especially for this event by one of the performers who's on the panel with us. And then the panelists are going to offer comments on the piece. So everybody will get to hear sort of from the three composers who are panelists and then also the organist who performed their piece. And um, the performers made these recordings without any communication with the composer, which we thought would be pretty useful um, because it's going to um, really sort of allow the performer to talk a little bit about their perspective on engaging with the score and the choices that they made in the recording process on, and with engaging with their specific organ that they were using. So as a heads up to all the composers in the audience and also to the composers who took part in this, um, we will be holding another call for scores in March of 2021 that will be in the form of a competition. So as this one was for a reading so that we could learn a lot about how to write for the organ, the selected composer for the competition will receive a monetary prize and the work will be premiered on the Music and Message series at Hendrix Chapel at Syracuse University in fall of 2021. This call is open to everyone. And certainly anyone who submitted to our call this summer is invited to revise and resubmit their work for this competition. So just watch our Facebook page for more details in the coming months. So we're going to start with Paulette. Uh, Paulette, would you like to say a, a brief hello? Let's see if Paulette's here. Uh, hi, sorry, I was muted. That's okay. It's lovely to see you and to hear you. Great. I'm glad you're here. Um, just so you have some biographical information about Paulette, uh, she made her living as a music and mathematics teacher in the Cincinnati School District and business administrator in the Marathon School District. She has made a life as an organist in the United Presbyterian Church of Portland for the past 42 years. She studied organ with Dr. Frank Eldridge at Ithaca College as an undergraduate and graduate student and has also studied organ for a couple summers with Will Headley. So Paulette comes to this with the perspective of somebody who knows the instrument but wanted to get some more advice about how to write for it as a composer. Paulette's piece is an arrangement of the tune Twas in the Moon of Wintertime and we're going to share a recording of the performance by Augustin Sobang on the Holt Camp Organ in Setner Auditorium. Augustine is pursuing his master's in organ performance at Syracuse University. So give me just two seconds to work my share screen so you can see the score and hear this recording.
great. So I think what I'll do is I'll have us start with George. George, would you like to start with your comments on this piece? Uh, sure. Thanks very much, Paulette. This lovely French Noel is one of my favorites. The piece is relatively easy to play, which I think is a big plus for many organists. Even with all the Christmas Eve organ pieces, there's always room for one more. The modal theme is mysterious with its minor third and flat seventh. The quasi organ and parallel fifths accompaniment works nicely in this piece and gives it a bit of an ancient feel. I would appreciate having some registration details. The pitches of the manuals are not clear. For example, one might specify soft eight foot foundations for the right hand accompaniment and a clarinet or other soft reed eight foot for the left hand solo line. That's pretty much, I think, what Augustine figured out and what he did. <clears throat> At measure 21, it wasn't clear to me whether the pedal was playing a 16 foot or eight foot pitch. So it, it's good to, to, to specify uh, at least the pitches. There were um, a few places that I would suggest maybe checking for unintended parallel fifths and octaves. And on occasion, there were also unnecessary doublings in a few, a few of the passages. But I think the most important remark uh, I want to make is, is uh, ending the, the piece on triple F. Uh, perhaps uh, the, the feeling was that the heavenly host has arrived Trumpets are sounding, the, the shepherds are, are there, uh, arriving in wonderment at the stable, and the, you know, the, the star is, is beaming down and everything is incredible. And, and that's, that's what the, uh, the last uh, accord with the Tierce de Picardie uh, indicates. Uh, but uh, for me, ending softly and peacefully on, on perhaps open fifths without without a third in, uh, in the chord in the left hand would keep more of the mystery and serenity of the movement. Uh, it, it's just one person's opinion and, and uh, but, but that, that's sort of my feeling. And it, it's in a way also based uh, on my own arrangement of, uh, of this uh, Noel, along with a second Noel, the Noel Nouvelle, uh, a little choral arrangement I made a number of years ago. Uh, uh, and in that arrangement, uh, there was a little bit of a rise, a uh, crescendo in the middle, a little bit of harmonic development, and then, and then ending with, with uh, both Noels playing at the same time. And, and at the end, a pianissimo uh, open fifths sort of like the uh, uh, the Ravel uh, Pavan ends very quietly on open fits. So those are my ideas, Paulette. Uh, thank you. It was, uh, had some lovely ideas in there and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I think now we'll switch to Joe. Joe, could you give some comments? Sure. Um, this is a tune beloved to me. I'm Canadian. This is not a French Noel. It is a French Canadian Noel. And I want to tell you the story because this is the kind of the coolest story behind this too. Um, there was a French mission in near present day Midland, Ontario. And my sister lives in Midland. I've been there dozens of times through my life. So there was this French mission there in the 17th century. And one of the priests there, his name was Father Jean Brebeuf. And he wanted to tell the Christmas story to the native Huron Indians. And so, but he was afraid that, you know, shepherds at a manger with kings bearing gold, friends, myrrh in, and incense, um, that that would be just incomprehensible. So he retold the story, and the original text to this carol 
is not in French nor English. It is in Huron. It's in the Huron language, and it's only recently been uh, republished. You can find it on the internet now. And in that story, rather than tell, having the kings bearing gold, frankincense, and myrrh, he says that the chiefs from brought gifts of fox and beaver pelt. So things that were obviously precious to that culture. The story has a sad ending, unfortunately, because there was a, there were political problems in those times. There was a big, in that area, there was a, a lot of conflict between the English trappers and the, the French. And the English trappers committed some atrocities on the Indians and the Indians, the Hurons, responded in kind against the other white men, um, not making any distinguishing, uh, any distinguishing between the English and the French. They were just the white men from over the sea. And so they actually brutally murdered uh, Father Jean Brabeuf and everyone in the mission. And that was kind of the end of the French mission. But this carol has survived. And Father Brebeuf was later canonized. And there is the shrine, uh, St. Marie among the Hurons, that is still there at Midland, Ontario today. And there's still this lovely carol that, that was written by one of the earliest French Canadian, it's one of the earliest French Canadian pieces that we have and very much beloved of, of, uh, by Canadians because it's one of, our, one of the earliest pieces written. In, in Canada. So uh, that said, I think you've written a lovely piece. I think it's very useful. This is the sort of thing that it, it's approachable and any organist would be happy to play it on Christmas Eve. Um, I noted that, and obviously when you wrote this, you knew this, between measure 16 and 17, you have the hand jump up about an octave and a half. And necessarily, Augustine, when he played that, there's a break there. And I think that it's musical and that it can work. I only point it out as an example for everyone else to know that, again, as I said this morning, on the organ, you can't play legato, legato when you're jumping, making large leaps. There's no pedal to sustain the sound. Once your hand leaves the manuals, it's going to be gone. Um, now, in contrast to what George said, uh, I was going to say if you wanted that crescendo at the end, my suggestion would be because the organ can build its volume in, in a couple of different ways, you can add more stops, that's going to add more sound. You can open a swell box if you've got one, that's more sound. But the other way might be effect more effective if you want the third way, if you want to have this crescendo at the end. And that would be start with four notes in a chord, then write five, and then write six. And the chords, because they are detached at the end, as I spoke before, that would be another way of helping that, that idea of crescendo. So that's just a couple of little, I also agree that the um, it would have been very helpful to have more registration suggestions. Again, I'm not a fan of telling organists, you know, now add exactly this stop because they probably don't have exactly that stop. But just some general um, suggestions, as George said, you know, do you want just foundation stops? Do you want um, brilliance? Do you want, etc., things like that. So uh, thank you for writing that piece. As I say, it'll be very useful for organists, especially um, us Canadians who love this tune so much. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I think that we were really pleased in this with this selection of these four that we were going to have everything ranging from an arrangement of this to some like a sort of modernist concert piece. So I'm really glad that we got to have this in the mix. And Paula, I think this arrangement is quite beautiful and effective. It works well for the instrument. It offers many opportunities for registrational changes. Um, and I really love the opening 
with these sort of slow moving descending fifths that then gradually become sort of rhythmically faster as they sort of fall into lockstep with the melody around measure 13. I was wondering if maybe from a compositional standpoint, if the opening could even be more mysterious, like if you could start out with the single line that's just the upper part of the fifth and then gradually add fifths in maybe around like measure nine to sort of show a new phrase um, and sort of have it build that way. I also wondered if, you know, when they do sort of change from fifth to fifth, it's always on a strong beat. And you could sort of make it a bit more abstract and mysterious by um, displacing some of the metric placement of some of those fifths so they can kind of float over that melody and then maybe coalesce and be sort of more metrical at the point around 13, something that I thought might be kind of interesting to experiment with. Um, and this brings me to sort of a general thing about this arrangement, which I think has sort of already been touched on by Joe, which is that it leaves a decent amount up to the performer, which is really great because they can they can do a lot with the registrations to sort of build and, and um, uh, subtract density to it. But I do think that you can do a lot on the compositional end as well, sort of what I just mentioned with like the fist being just a line and then becoming the fist and what Joe was saying about them, you know, you could have these sort of chords that build and get more cluster like toward the end of this. Um, and um, another example of that is in the way that you wrote this echo, you know, the, the echo here is totally up to registrational change. I mean, there's a little bit you left out sort of the octave and the pedal, but I wonder if this could also be revoiced or thinned out or something to, to sort of make it a little bit more, um, more embedded into the work that there's an echo there um, that will then just be added to with the, with the registration change as well. So just, I think, you know, arrangements are a funny business because they can be anything from a really sort of um, close transcription of the original setting to something that is kind of experimental and wild. And I would say, you know, this one is is closer to being sort of um, like trying to stay true to the work. Don't be afraid to um, make things more abstract, to pay, uh, play with accompaniment patterns, um, and to sort of reinterpret some things with the meter and with breadth. I think all of that could be really interesting with us. But I absolutely agree. I think that it's a really great piece. It is practically very, very useful. There would be lots of organists who would want to play this. So I'm going to turn it over to Augustine to talk a little bit about how it was to perform this piece on the organ that he performed it on. So Augustine, it's like your turn. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> so uh, I performed this on the host camp in a um, certain auditorium. And uh, Paulette, thank you for the piece. I, I must say, well, when I played the piece the first time, I thought it was going to be a very simple job for me because I could basically sight read a number of things except some points with their pedal and stuff. But uh, after meeting my professor the first day, I knew it was not going to be you know, easy as much as I thought, right? So I had a lot of work to do and I found interest, interesting things. Um, first of all, I think it's a very beautiful and simple arrangement, it's straightforward and it's balanced. We can see where it's headed. We can see the buildup in intensity, texture, harmony, and you use some re really cringy harmonies toward the end, some A flat and A in the same chord, F and F sharp in the same chord. And, you know, I had some doubts about them, but after some time I was like, well, you know, it works. And then uh, the details, I, I felt there could be some more marking on detail as they've, all the three people who spoke have spoken about them and it gave me extra work as they said but i enjoy doing it so you know it's fine however for from my perspective as a performer what i found most difficult was the the tempo marking uh measure 45 there's um mm, okay yeah that's a retard in measure 40 44 is that no 40, 43 and then there's uh, there's our tempo in 45. At this point, I we I couldn't tell what I was returning to. Was it the tempo right at the beginning or the tempo when it slowed down around measure 20 or so? Uh, yeah, there. 
about yeah mr 22 i couldn't tell which temple i was returning to so i mean in good taste i just used what sounded most comfortable for all the heavy chords that were coming i thought it would be too fast to go with the uh, the half note 284 that was something that could be clarified more aside that well i also had issue with the double pedaling it was easily overbearing so it gave me some much work with registration to balance it out but other than that what helped me was that the intention you were trying to get across was very clear we could see the build up the intensity and everything so you know you just that was a, the guiding principle for for most of what i did and the tune was carried through very well like i didn't know the tune unlike like uh dr downing who gave a whole history of i, I just heard it this like you know when i touched this piece but the tune sort of remains with me because you really handled the tune very well it was clear as dr draper said you did not go very far off from the tune which helps me because then i keep remembering the tune every time and so yeah my dr liver helped me to keep a balanced registration and bring out more subtle features i said as i was playing i was discovering more things and so yes i think this piece is something that will help organists and thank you for writing it Great, thanks so much. Okay, we're going to, well, I feel like I wanna, I don't know, can we just have a moment of applause or something? Uh, Paulette, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna switch now and talk about Thomas Metcalf's pixelations movements uh, five and 12. So just give me a minute to switch up my share um, and we'll get going on that. Um, so just one second, just trying to do too many things at once. <laughs> All right. I am almost there. And let's have Thomas say hello to yeah, Thomas. so we can find him. Hello. Awesome. Hello and welcome. Okay. So um just to give a little bit of background on Thomas. Uh, Thomas Metcalf is a researcher and composer studying for a DPhil at Oxford University. His research focuses on the transformation of graphical spaces into determinate musical ones and how this can be incorporated into contemporary compositional practice. Articles on his own music, as well as that of Kenneth Hesketh and other contemporary composers, will be published in Tempo, Question, and Leonardo in the coming months. Upcoming projects include pieces for the Kreutzer Quartet, players of the Safa Ensemble, and the Fantasia Orchestra. Other than composition and research, Thomas is also a tutor at Oxford in topics of music history since 1900. So Thomas's piece is entitled Pixelation Variations. And actually, in lieu of um, me reading this, I was wondering, Thomas, if you might explain a little bit about sort of what's behind this piece before we start. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, basically, the, the piece uses um, a, a sort of linear map of the River Thames uh, that becomes increasingly pixelated over 12 movements. Uh, and this is represented through the harmonic material in sort of a, another type of pixelation, which you can see on the screen here, it's sort of an averaging process where you sort of multiply the, find the midpoint of each two adjacent pitches. Um, and yeah, basically, uh, it, this happens over 12 uh, movements. And then by the end, uh, you get a single pixel because the pic it's such a pixelated image. It just boils down to one big pixel. And that's reflected in the music by um, just one cluster that's been sort of generated through this sort of iterative process. Uh, so, yeah, I think that, that's sort of that's the general gist. Great. Thank you. We were only able to do two movements from this piece. This piece is long, it's about 30 minutes or 25, I, 25 there you can see. Um, and we did movements five and movements 12. Um, so I'll go ahead and play these for you all so you can hear them. These were performed by Jonathan Embry. So he will be, I'm gonna let him comment first once we're done listening um, on his experience performing these two pieces. So here we go. Mm -hmm.
I'm going to pause it here for one second, just because before we play the next movement, I wanted to show you all what the score looks like, because I'm actually going to make it smaller so you can see it all at once. This is a graphic score. So we see that um, the hand, there are two weights that are placed down to create this sonority throughout. And then um, the dynamics and the timbre change over time, we get these different dynamic markings. Um, and it's sort of two pages of this going through these different levels of dynamic markings before it comes off. But it's up to the organist to do the registration changes in all of this. So I'm gonna make this uh, just a little bit smaller so it can all sort of fit on one screen and you have a sense of what's going on. Okay, here is this movement. Okay, so I think we'll start with Jonathan. Jonathan, this you had to interpret this on a different organ. How did it go? Um, well, I found it was satisfying to work with this um, piece on the organ at St. Paul's. It's a very large organ, so there's a lot of opportunities for interesting combinations of sounds. Um, I found that um, while working with this graphic notation, I couldn't do exactly what Thomas wanted with weights down on the keyboard. So I had the different divisions, different manuals set up with different stop combinations. And I would rotate my hands on um, to, to change the sounds. And I would use the crescendo pedal in the swell box, depending on which sounds I was using to sort of match the shape of the river. Um, I personally, love the idea of motion and music. So seeing this, this design um, helped with a lot of, it helped create ideas and how the, the dynamic should flow and it should move very fluidly. Um, I have to say that um, I was very impressed and pleased with the writing in this work. 
this isn't the sort of language that I'm used to playing, but I found that it actually fits very well into the, it fits very idiomatic to the organ. Expect even this part in the beginning with the pedal, it's not terrible, it's not very uncomfortable to play it. And I have to say chapeau to that because a lot of uh, composers when they're writing new music for the organ, it's often unplayable. But all of the movements in this work, I feel, were very um, grounded in what the organ can do. The sort of s small texture, independent writing, I think, is very um, successful. Um, the only questions that I have would be about sort of the, the timing of the gestures. Are the um, gestures intended to be absolutely perfect metronomically or as a gesture? That's what I would be curious about. Thomas, do you want to chime in? <laughs> um, I think I think with this one, um, if you sort of see it in the in the context of what's just come before it, I know that's impossible for sort of most of the people here, but what's just come before this is a very rhythmic, energetic, you know, uh, movement that's sort of just in these sort of quite dissonant chromatic, full of energy, and it ends on a very sort of a heavy sort of downbeat. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is sort of seen as this sort of reflective, I don't know, uh, reconstruction, sort of getting back on track. So I don't think that it's meant to be seen absolutely sort of, you know, metronomically uh, sort of, you know, strict. I think you can have this sort of freedom within the phrases themselves. And I think sort of the, the shapes of the phrases can, can maybe guide that. Um, you know, maybe in the sort of second page, perhaps, uh, I think in the top, when it goes into quavers, that sort of, da, da, ya, da, you know, you can sort of maybe either stretch that or just shorten it a little bit, just to give that sort of idea that the original, you know, uh, melody line is becoming a little bit changed or sort of um, corrupted is a sort of, corruption is an idea in this piece that sort of runs throughout. And this is maybe the first introduction of sort of ideas like that in quite a restrained setting. So. Uh, I don't know whether that answers the question. Um, well, it, 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 it does for this movement. The only, um, I'm wondering, because you have some fascinating gestures in the movements that we can't see right now. There's some very interesting <laughs> figurations that are written in uh, like sex, sex tuplets, sing tuplets, and mm. various interesting rhythms that I'm wondering if you want those all exactly in time, or would you like it as sort of a um, mosaic of gestures? Um, I think in some respects, uh, I, I would want the organist to see it in the context of what's happening over the whole piece, the idea that over the piece things are becoming more pixelated, more, less clear, less, making less sense, you know, from when you have the original image, by movements, you know, eight onwards, it doesn't really look like a river anymore, it just sort of looks like sort of random pixels. Um, so I think that there can be a certain freedom or again more agency given to the organist's interpretation and, and freedom of, of gesture for example as the piece goes on such that as you see by the end um agency is completely well almost completely given to the organist to sort of mm -hmm. uh you know fill in you know what, what's left basically of that pixel great and uh, just the last thought I, I oh sorry no go ahead Jonathan. i have one small just my last thought is I really like your use of dynamics and descriptions. I think that that is wonderful because I knew exactly the sound that you wanted when it said apocalyptic and mis <laughs> like haunting. And I thought that, that, that that's really a great way to convey the sort of affect and atmosphere that you want. And I think that that's a, I really, I appreciated that very much. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. I know that you have to run. So I didn't I wanted you to get yep. your comments in. Yep, now. I gotta go. <laughs> See you. Um, I'll turn this over to George. George, what comments would you like to offer to Thomas? Um, hi, Thomas. Uh, thanks so much for your contribution. It's certainly quite an interesting contrast from uh, our first piece. <clears throat> we only heard two of the 12 variations, of course, uh, probably the easiest to play. And uh, 
I think one really needs to hear the entire piece to give it a fair shake. Uh, this is an example of what I call concept composing. In this case, a study of contours based on visual ideas that must be explained to the audience. I appreciated having the visuals available with the score. Uh, I also appreciated knowing how the notes were chosen. Uh, the concept of pixelation is is, is fascinating and uh, the mathematical averages and all of that, uh, I mean, is fascinating. Uh, certainly, I think it would be a good idea for the concert audience to be supplied with, with the graphics and the explanatory notes. So they just, you know, don't come into it completely uh, uh, not knowing anything to expect. Um, in my opinion, I would prefer the piece to have some specific registration suggestions. And again, in my opinion, uh, less is not always more. Less sometimes is too little. Uh, desired stop pitches and families, perhaps at the very minimum, for me would be very helpful information as guides for the performance. I mean, obviously you could figure it out. You could figure it out and uh, uh, the performance we just heard, uh, the performer uh, ably and, and, and beautifully figured it out. Uh, also, I think the work needs a really large, very powerful and very colorful organ. Instruments that come to mind for this piece uh, include the Fisk Opus 100 organ at the Meyerson Symphony Center, or perhaps the Walt Disney Concert Hall organ in Los Angeles and maybe Notre Dame organ in the organ loft. Because dynamic markings of F, 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 F cannot be reasonably obtained on many other instruments. Uh, and I would love to hear uh, the colors of the organ, the cornets, the solo reeds, string celestes, rich foundation choruses, and those types of colors could be specified uh, during during the piece here and there. You don't have to go to the extent of, of Messia and his Mess de la Ponticote, but you know, just, just kind of more uh, more general basic instructions that could help uh, help the performer uh, figure out how to best present the piece. Uh, for contrasting ideas, I, I mentioned uh, Messian's piece. Uh, a couple of other composers come to mind that would make for good listing for people. Uh, and those are William Albright and Jean-Louis Florence, both of whom tragically died in their 50s. Both of those uh, uh, men were, were, were students of Olivier Messiaen. But it, it certainly was a lovely change of pace, uh, a breath of fresh air, and thank you so much, Thomas. I appreciate it very much. Great, I think we'll switch to Joe. Joe, what do you have to say? Okay, first of all, I'm fascinated by hearing things that are normally seen. I remember as a student listening to the music of Iana Xenakis and thinking, I just heard a bell curve. I had seen lots of bell curves in my life, but I had never heard one before I heard the music of Xenakis. So I'm very pleased to see this, this aural representation of the Tom's River. Now, I want to talk about long notes. One of the benefits of the organ is it can sustain low notes forever. There's really no other instrument that can do that that I'm aware of. Um, so while one of the organ's strengths is its ability to sustain the same tap sound for an indefinite period of time, one must be careful not to tire the ear. So a lot can depend on the organ here. I remember once playing uh, the little Buxtehude Siakona in E minor on, on a Holt Camp organ down at Colgate University. I played the whole piece on the eight foot principle and it was just lovely and peaceful and mesmerizing. The, the next week, the very next week, I was going to play, the nice thing about being a substitute organist that year is you can play the same pieces every week. 
And so I was going to play the next week on a very large electronic, custom electronic instrument. And so I put on the eight foot principle to play the piece and I hadn't finished the first page before I was ready to shoot myself. Just because that same sound no longer mesmerized the ear, it just bore right through me. It just completely was a tiring sound. Um, so I had to change my approach on that particular piece and change the registration. I want to tell you a second story. Here in Syracuse, we have a, a world famous soprano who has been a champion of new music. Her name is Neva Pilgrim. Decades ago, they recorded her voice at EarCam in Paris, the electronic uh, music studio that's been so um, influential in, in the world of electronic music. And a guy had come back to Syracuse, actually. He did a master class for us. He didn't even know it was Neva's voice he was using, but he was demonstrating what they had manipulated. And this happened in the late 80s. So electronic music wasn't anything what it was today. And what he did was he had her singing this piece with, without breathing for several minutes. So you heard this, what sounded like a live soprano who was singing this line that just went on and on and on and there was no breath anywhere. And most of the audience found it very distressing. Literally, people themselves were gasping for air sympathetically with this soprano who obviously wasn't getting any air. So I've kind of drawn a, a parallel to that, that how long should a note be sustained? Because I do play an instrument that can sustain forever. My general rule is that sustained notes shouldn't last much longer than a wind musician or a singer could, could play or sing them. Not because it can't be done, because, but because it tends to tire the ear. So I noticed even the tempos that Jonathan took in this piece were faster than you had marked. I was kind of following on the metronome and finding no. And why was he doing that? I think because the notes were so long that he was tiring of them. And you know, you can find lots of examples, messy on lots of times, holds notes an incredibly long time. My advice though is that it does tend to tire the ear. ear. Um, particularly on the 12th movement, I like the idea of graphic notation and I like the idea of using the timbres of the organ as kind of a clang farben melody, which is what we kind of experienced here. So, uh, and I also like the ascending and descending line but there were, at measure 12, for instance, when the line was moving to, from left to right, and then it went backwards. And I thought, how do I make time go backwards? So I was a little confused as to what that could mean in the score. Um, I, would, I would hope that sometime, like George said, that we could hear the entire piece performed. It's a fresh new approach. Um, and in spite of what I said about the, the sustained chords and notes in the fifth movement, I really like the idea of the Klang Farben melody of the 12th movement, although I do support George's idea of specifying, you know, you could say here you're down to just Celeste and here should be up to mixtures and here should be just reeds or something like that. So that's my, just, my suggestions. Uh, I think it's really a cool piece. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'll offer some of my comments and then we'll move on. I'll sort of keep them short because I know we want to stay close to the time. But just as a little bit of a counter to Joe, um, I actually like the long notes. I, I like the, the long sustain. You know, I think that electronic music is such a part of, of our lives these days that I didn't even think twice about it. It didn't bother me at all. Um, which is just that's part of why we wanted to have three people on the panel too, so that you get lots of different uh, different perspectives about that. 
Um, but I thought that both of these movements are really colorful. I really liked movement five because it is so patient um, and the harmonies are so sort of rich. Uh, in a way, it reminds me a little bit of like Schoenberg's Farben. Um, it has sort of that like slow, murky kind of vibe to it. Um, I did think that, you know, it was kind of interesting that the way the notes worked, you know, in the beginning, it's a little bit more consonant than how it sort of ends up. And um, like right in this area versus when we start this stuff and it gets crunchy and then it sort of stays crunchy. Um, and I think that in terms of what's tiring to the ear, it is a lot of harmonic content that is the same. You know, there's a lot, there are a lot of sort of uh, major sevenths or half steps or sort of um, clusters that are voiced out over space. And I think that, that that can contribute to something being sounding a little bit tiring, but I actually liked it. I mean, may, maybe it was just sort of that I liked that those particular harmonies, but I thought it was a really cool, um, unusual texture that worked really nicely. Um, and I liked that you would have sort of these these statements and then a rest and then a statement and then sort of a change. Um, it was it was cool. The last movement, I was really happy to have a graphic score just because that was I think that's a good thing to show to everyone. And I also think it's a really it's a nice use of the organ um, to really leave it up to sort of the organist deciding how they're going to do these registrational changes. But I was also, like Joe, confused a little bit about the notation and was wondering if you could take just a minute to sort of clarify how this is working. Because I was wondering if we were following this like a path, in which case I also didn't know how we sort of would go back here or, or what, what, the, what we're supposed to do with the line. So if you could clarify a bit, Thomas. Yeah, I mean, to an extent, it, it is up to sort of how you, your interpretation of that particular line. However, I think there's a few ways you can do it. As you say, if you if you were to flow through it, you do end up going back on yourself. This is sort of impossible. So you could read it as some sort of a scan of moving from left to right, um, sort of like a computer reading it. Um, an interesting um, aspect of uh, the, the dedicatee of the, of the piece, uh, and I have been working on bits of this, and we've talked a little about this. Um, and he, interestingly, had a, a take that I hadn't thought of before and that he, he was understanding it as the area under the line, sort of like an integral mathematical way of thinking of it. Uh, that amount of space was sort of what was being interpreted. Um, and sort of when these sort of strange moments where that it sort of overlaps on itself, they happen. Um, I think in, in sort of things we've done, uh, you know, he added pedal you know, which isn't specified, but it's sort of, again, that sort of cognitive distance of having to do that impossible thing has this sort of insertion um, that sort of matches that. And again, otherworldly, I suppose, you know, uh, it's taking some liberties with, uh, you know, the, uh, the notation, but it's not uh, intended to be sort of too prescriptive um, because, you know, in the narrative of the piece, there is basically nothing left other than this cluster. So. Uh, it's it sort of is largely up to how uh, the organist um, perceives that line uh, rather than anything particularly formal. Great, thank you. And thank you for the piece. It was a really nice uh, contribution yeah, no. to this group of four. Thanks so very I'll much give, for uh, doing it. <clears throat> yeah, let's give Thomas a round of applause. <laughs> All right, I'm going to switch over to uh, uh, Sam Gaskin. Sam, could you say hello? Hello. Hi, welcome. All right, I'm going to share your work. Um, and this one, um, let's get organized here. Let me first introduce you all to Sam. Sam completed graduate studies in organ performance from the University of North Texas with Dr. Jesse Eschbach in 2018. In 2013, he was a finalist in the Mikhail uh, Tereverdiev International Organ Competition held in Kaliningrad, Russia, and received first prize in the 2016 University of Michigan International Organ Improvisation Competition. Sam enjoys performing with a wide range of performers and ensembles and recently performed at the 2020 North American Saxophone Alliance Convention with the Aruna Quartet. 
Samuel has studied composition with William James Ross, uh, S. Andrew Lloyd, and Ethan Wickman, and in his spare time, he enjoys playing ultimate frisbee and walking his dog, Theo. So Samuel's piece is entitled uh, De Profundis, um, and we're going to share a recording of a performance by Anne Laver on the Holt Camp organ in Setner Auditorium. So here is the. Thank you. 
great. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with uh, George, if you could give some feedback. Sure. Uh, thank you, Samuel. This is a piece that uses the full resources of the organ. It's based on the magnificent and profound Martin Luther hymn 1524, Aus Note, which is a paraphrase of Psalm 130. I appreciated very much having detailed registrations, tempo, and dynamic markings. Such details are always helpful for the performer, in my opinion. I would uh, like to know, uh, Samuel, the inspiration behind the pedal ostinato, which plays a big part in the piece. Was there any sort of influence from Najee Hakim's uh, style of organ writing? Uh, as I was listening to that ostinato, I thought that it would be possible to bring that ostinato up into the hands, perhaps uh, with colorful chords going back and forth uh, and at that point, the Astifer note theme could appear in the pedal, sort of like a Cantus Firmus. Uh, I would have enjoyed hearing a larger continuous segment of the main theme during the first few measures of the composition. Jean Langlais would often suggest to his students to play the theme through before you start developing it. You don't have to play the whole thing, but maybe just, you know, eight to 10 notes or something like that. Uh, instead of just the da da da. Uh, his own setting of the De Profundis in his Nuff Pies is a good example to study. But certainly it's a very effective, very interesting piece. Ends on a beautiful chord. Love the F sharp major. It's one of Messian's favorite, uh, favorite uh, keys also, F sharp major. So thanks so very much, Samuel. Great, Joe, what would you like to say? So I love the pedal writing and what I, you know, I, I like to deal on the technical side of the writing and that pedal part in the beginning sounds absolutely terrific. And yet if you look how he's written it and he wanted, you know, I would hold this up as an example of how to write a good pedal solo because it's all alternate feet. It sounds terrific, but the alternate high, low, high, low writing makes it easier to play than it really sounds. And I'm always appreciative when that happens. I did want to point out uh, again on the technical side in measure 58, where the right hand is doing gestures up and down, iliatoric things, and the left hand is alternating C minor triads with the E major triad below, that's a hard thing to do on the organ. And I'm not sure that, especially when they start to alternate very quickly, you just can't move your hand that fast. So um, a suggestion there. Also at the beginning, um, I'm always confused when parallel octaves are written for both hands because the organ will do that for yourself. Um, and it'll do it cleaner than you could play it, um, although this is not hard to play cleanly at the beginning. So, for instance, if your registration at the beginning was 8, 4, 2, and 1, or even 8 and 2 with an octave coupler, it accomplishes the very same means of both hands playing in unison. Um, I liked the registration suggestions. It was really clear that you wanted without asking for too specific of stops. Um, because, you know, when we ask for really specific stops, they might not be available on every organ. Uh, for example, you ask for the bombard on there, and I've actually never, my home organ that I've played in the last 50 years, I've never played an organ that actually had a bombard stop on it. But, I certainly would know how to fake that. And that was about the only one that got really specific. I think this is really a strong piece and I hope to see it in, in some competitions, you know, people for the 20th century piece or 21st century. Yet. So congratulations, great piece. Great, thanks Joe. Um, so I'll give my comments now and then turn it over to Annie. Um, 
I think it's a piece with a very clear dramatic arc that makes great use of the extreme louds and softs of the instrument and also makes great use of the many colorful characters that you can get on the organ. Sort of the loud, brash, cacophonous stuff that you have with the aleatoric bit in the middle and then a very gentle lyrical feel in the second half of the piece. Um, it's well paced too. I think it's interesting that, you know, that um, improvisatory moment that is very loud sort of hits like a third to a halfway through the duration of the piece and then the rest feels like this sort of um, winding down from that and letting us relax a bit and I, I think that that actually works quite well. Um, I also liked your comfort sort of with going between the the sort of heavily notated stuff for the organist, but then also giving them some freedom to do some of the sort of improvisatory material. I thought the, um, where is it? Sorry, I'm speeding through this. Yeah, I thought that your notation is very clear. You know, it's sort of clear what you want uh, the organist to do and clear what the sound world is. Um, which is helpful. And then this bit here is a nice sort of aleatoric like go between between this material and then these chords. I thought that was very sort of an effective transition out of a more improvisatory area to a completely notated area. Um, so that was great. I, and just in general, I think, you know, it's a really interesting piece. Um, in many ways, it feels like there are these sort of two halves to it. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't come across uh, as if they aren't connected. Like they're very, it's very cohesive, I think largely because of that sort of stepwise material that you have, although, you know, done in the way that you did it in the pedals, and then some of the stepwise material that you have at the end to really connects it. Um, so yeah, congratulations. I think, it, I think it's quite nice. And I'll let Annie talk about how it was to put it together at the organ. Yeah, well, this, this was fun to play. Samuel, thanks so much for submitting this work. Um, I think one of the things that does make it cohesive is the chant itself. And I really like the way that you use the chant in uh, very creative uh, textures. Um, so I, I agree with George, it would be nice to sort of have at least a phrase of it at the beginning, um, even though this chant in Chip It is really striking. So we, we get it right at the beginning and you help us out with the text aus tiefer uh, to signal that you're using a fragment of the opening. Um, but I love the way you fragment it, develop it, uh, play it in parallel thirds, and then you bring us back and you give us the chant finally in its full form at the end. So I, I really like the way you used it. Um, one comment about the pedal, um, you're, you're asking for 32 foot pretty much throughout. And that's one reason why I wanted to record it upstairs because we have a very nice 32 foot board in, but um, it also muddies the sound a little bit. So that pedal ostinato, I had to use a four foot just for a little bit of extra clarity. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. You know, if you want a fast moving pedal or if you want a pedal solo, sometimes you need the mixtures and the reeds to make it work. Um, and then the other thing is at the very end of the piece, when you ask for the, maybe we could go to that, Natalie. Um, when you ask for uh, maybe the top of that page or the previous page actually, um, you have the, the melody in the pedal, but you've got many pitch levels sounding. So one idea would be to just let the melody be at eight foot pitch or even four foot pitch with that reed sound if you like it. And then allow the left hand to take the lower pitch, the lower uh, register, and uh, just move that all down. Um, because they're sort of all occupying the same space and it, it felt like it was hard to make that make the melody come through. I, I also had to add a forefoot to the um, melodic line in the right hand just because it had to balance with all the stuff in the pedal. Uh, so just something to think about. In that uh, last section of the piece, I love the seventh chords. They, they were great. Um, they were kind of like moments of of sweetness in, in the midst of this piece. 
Um, the other thing I would say is Joe said it was easy, but uh, I would say this piece is on the challenging end, uh, even though the pedal writing is idiomatic. It's certainly idiomatic, uh, even though it is challenging to put everything together. Um, I have to say there were a couple things that didn't work for me uh, just because of the way uh, my hands are. I couldn't play the last chord you wanted in the left hand, the, the fifth and thumb down. I it just, I dropped the F sharp um, in bar 105, I had to drop it. And there were a few parallels in the loud section um, in the feet and the top voice in the hands. And I, I wondered if you might uh, try not having the parallel there. Maybe you wanted it, but uh, bar 50, for example, the E's kind of uh, really struck me as being like, oh, they're the same, top E and E in the pedal. Um, but maybe that's what you want. That's, that's totally fine. It's just something I noticed. Um, and then I needed help figuring out what to do with the aleatoric section. And you know what I did? I watched your video. Uh, so you, everybody got a sense of the great uh, improvisation skills that Samuel has from the, the intro we, we offered. Um, it was very interesting that Samuel submitted a recording of him playing this that didn't quite match the score. And I just wanted to ask you, Samuel, what role does improvisation, or what role did improvisation play in the writing of this particular piece? I think that would be kind of interesting for us to hear. Yeah, um, well, yeah, thank you so much for the great performance. Um, really appreciate that. And yeah, regarding improvisation, um, yeah, the initial idea was not, like the initial idea was the beginning with the ostinato and the melody and the hands. And really I only used improvisation once I kind of hit up against a creative wall and I kind of needed to generate some more ideas and, and develop the material. So specifically like leading up to the aleatoric section and most of the last section was coming from improvisations just to get more, more ideas, so yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it was really it was really fascinating to watch you play it and to notice that you're doing some different different things with um, you know we got a we got a slightly I guess updated version of this score from you um, so anyway I I needed that help in bar 58 and following and you know in the normal process I'd probably just ask you but uh, it was great to have that that help of of getting an idea of what you were going for there. Great piece, great job. Great, thanks Sam, yay. <laughs> All right, switch it up to our last composer here who's uh, Matthew Slazik. So Matthew, could you say hello? Hi everybody. Welcome. All right, I'm gonna switch my share to your piece. Um, let's see if I can find it, here we go. Okay, so Matthew's piece, well, first I need to introduce you to Matthew, which is bio. Um, Matthew is a composer, pianist, trombonist, and audio engineer. He is a graduate of Tully Junior Senior High School and is currently studying music composition at the State University of New York at Fredonia. Matthew's piece, as you can see here, is entitled Event Horizon. And we're going to share a recording of a performance by Alex Metzler on the Quimby organ at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. All right, so I will start sharing that performance with you right now. <laughs>
All right, so let's start again with George. George, what feedback would you like to give? Okay, great. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, this piece uses interesting ideas for its conception and execution. I'm a big science and math geek, and I love chemistry, physics, and so forth. Therefore, I was most interested to hear the results of using the Fibonacci number sequence and the atomic numbers. I do think this piece really needs to be performed on a powerful, large organ capable of very loud volumes. The Big Bang was a big bang, the biggest bang in history of the universe, apparently. And it was loud. So the massive depiction at the beginning needs to be massive. I would say, put everything you got on and add a pedal cluster uh, to the uh, to the to the stuff in the hands to the chords in the hands for for a good five seven ten seconds before you cut it back down i don't think you can play this piece on just any instrument and um i missed having dynamics and pitch designations in this piece even if stops couplings and mixtures are left at the discretion of the performer in my opinion, we organists still need basic information such as eight foot, 16 foot, and so forth in order to deliver a reasonable performance. If the organ is in a dry room, the performer needs to make sure the rests don't kill the piece and the momentum continues because the stars don't take naps as they're developing. I felt the current performer did a really great job of that. Uh, towards the end of the piece, there was an awful lot of F in the pedal. And then finally going down to the B flat, uh, it, it, it must have been a circle of fifths because it just, uh, especially uh, rocking back and forth, uh, one, five, one, five, one at the end. And then, uh, you know, ending on that open fifth. Uh, and I think there was uh, closer to the first part of the piece, uh, a C somewhere in the pedal. So it, it, if if you kind of do a Schenkerian analysis, it's like a, a two five one progression uh, for the whole piece. Maybe that was intended. Maybe not. I don't know. But it it sort of struck me as that. Uh, so very interesting piece and uh, enjoyed it very much. And thanks so much. All right, Joe. What would you like to add? Um. I thought it was an impressive piece. I thought it was cohesive. I liked the, the conservation of material. I thought the material was well used throughout. Uh, so suggestions, registration, as George said, this was a great performance, but the performer needs more guidance, both to dynamics and tone color. When I looked at the first two pages before I heard what Alex had done in the performance, my concept of what I would have done given that score was very different from what Alex did. So I don't know which of us would have been closer to what your intent was. I thought Alex, when I listened to Alex's playing, he took each of the gestures and changed the registration for them. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I wouldn't even have thought of doing that. And, and yet that was a very positive thing. So even if your guidance is, just to change the registration for each of those gestures, or perhaps uh, more specific, you know, bright reeds, um, strong but powerful, um, soft, or celeste, or, or whatever, just something that we would get uh, an idea. I agree with George, this piece is going to be most effective on a very large, powerful organ. But I do want to point out for everybody listening, there's uh, there's a dirty little secret of organ playing. So the organ I play down at Plymouth Church is a 1930s molar. It's a four manual organ. The church only seats about 200 people. So this is apparently a built big organ for the room. But there's a dirty little secret to the organ. On this big four manual organ, there are only two stops on the pedal. There are only two ranks that only appear in the pedal. 
everything else on the pedal is borrowed from somewhere else on the organ. And this is very common in small and even medium sized organs. Now this is not true at St. Paul's where this is recorded, but on medium sized organs, uh, pedals will be completely borrowed from elsewhere in the organ. Why am I pointing this out? Because at measure 40, you have the pedal holding the F below middle C, and then you have these arpeggios going up and down, and they keep bumping on in the manuals that same F below middle C. And on a medium sized organ, there's a good chance that the pedal playing that F below middle C is already going to be sounding the pipes that you need for your arpeggio. So it's, it's just gonna come out of rest at those points. So that's just a little something to keep in mind. Again, on a large organ, they're going to have full ranks all the way in the pedal. There's another place where that's uh, noted, and I think it was measure 89, 40 and 70, I think, were, were where the pedal note was in the F. But at measure 79, you put the pedal in octaves. And, you know, sometimes we do that pedal in octaves, but I have to say, practically speaking, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to play the pedal in octaves, because even on organs that have independent ranks for the pedal, quite often they are borrowed themselves on the pedal between the octaves. So if you've got five pipes sounding on the low F and you go to play the F above that, you don't get another five pipes because four of them are already being used by the lower octave. So a lot of times, you know, Playing octaves in the pedal can give you a warm feeling and make you feel that you're doing a lot more and getting a lot more sound, but you really aren't. A lot of times it's not really making any difference at all. Again, I'm talking uh, mostly not about this piece here, which as George said, really demands a big organ, but for people who are thinking of writing for the organ, it's something to be aware of on small and medium sized instruments. Um, I really liked the piece. I thought you did a beautiful job and uh, kudos to you. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I think a lot has been already said, but I'll just say that, um, you know, I think it's an expansive piece. It's 10 minutes long, but I didn't notice that. It didn't feel wandering. I thought it was well paced. Um, I thought the ending was really lovely as it sort of coalesced on that fifth after getting all those, you know, more sort of rich and interesting chords with that pedal ending. Um, I did find myself wondering just from a compositional end, um, perspective if like the arpeggio gestures with the triplets could grow. You know, they're, they're often sort of doing a pattern that's like measure by measure, either it's like sort of an arc or it's like an ascent and then two descents or that kind of thing. There are about like three different patterns that they do. And I wonder if there could be times when it goes beyond one measure. You know, if you have an arpeggio that's maybe two measures or three measures or four, um, and you could kind of play with the way that could expand. Um, and the other thing that I was just wondering about is the Zimbelstern. You know, like when you submitted the piece, I really loved that effect. I thought it was magical, especially with the narrative of what you're trying to do with Event Horizon. And I have to admit that I sort of missed it, that it wasn't there, but in your instructions in the beginning, which I didn't show people, but I probably should have, um, it says a vibraphone playing the notes C, E, F sharp, and B in the manner of church bells may be used if a Zimbelstern is not available in a specific organ. And so I was just sort of wondering, you know, what's the solution for this piece to get the Zimbelstern effect if you're if you just have an organ, you know, you don't have a vibraphonist friend to, to do that for you. Um, what were you thinking, Matthew? Would you create sort of an alternate version that would maybe notate that in somehow? Or, or how did you feel about it? Yeah, so that was kind of a tricky thing that I ran across because on the organ I was working with at Fredonia, it had a, a Zimbelstern stop. And I wrote the piece with that in mind and come to find out it wasn't like it didn't actually work for some reason it was just there so the vibraphone was kind of my solution to not having the zimbal stern and 
kind of brainstorm, and I've been brainstorming ways to kind of fix that solution in the instance that it is just an organ without a simple sternum, you don't have the availability of a vibraphone. And I think what I would end up doing is potentially either shortening the distances between the pitches in that section, or especially at the entrance, or maybe even adding like little figurations up high with a specific um, set of registrations that would kind of emulate that effect a little bit at least. So I think what yeah. I would do. If I can just interject for a second, Please. a solution that I've used, again, I'm playing a 1930s romantic instrument that Zimbelstern was the last thing on anyone's <laughs> mind. Yeah. But I have a little set of, you know, aluminum wind chimes, and I have left them right on the console where okay. either I can just with my own hand or put them down on the floor and kick them with my foot mm -hmm. or have somebody else uh, just do that when I want that special little effect. You know, I only do it once every four years, something <laughs> like that, when I yeah. just want that Zimbelstern. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Cool. Well, Alex, what, how is this to play um, on your organ? Yeah, so I played this at St. Paul's downtown Syracuse. I'm not an organ. I'm particularly familiar with that was the first time I've played it in many years. Um, but I really enjoyed getting to know this piece. Um, so I learned it elsewhere and then sort of had to map my idea for what I had done on the organ that I was working with onto another organ, which wasn't the organ that you intended. So there's sort of these steps that I went through. Um, the first thing I wanna say is I found the piece to just be incredibly idiomatic. There are very few, if any, playing issues. Um, the, there's one, the arpeggios, um, the harder ones that go through the octaves. Um, one of those is a little challenging to play legato, um, but even that wasn't, you know, particular. It just took a little practice and boom, you've got it. Um, I would say that the thing that's hardest to play is the concentration it takes um, rhythmically. Um, the, the, the duration of this piece. And you actually mark it, uh, the whole piece is a shorter duration than I played it. I, I, the tempo that I took it may, may be uh, too slow. Um, but um, I just found that sometimes like, you know, bars of two and bars of three, and then it's slightly different. It just takes a lot of concentration. Uh, you know, concentration sometimes that I wish, um, I know you're deriving these these meters and, and rhythms from something that restricts you, but uh, which I like, uh, but it it can be very challenging sometimes to like just make sure that okay this one's two beats this one's one beat uh, um, yeah so uh, I'll echo what George uh, started saying I really missed registration markings I appreciate what you wrote in the preface and it really did make me feel free and I hope you appreciate I hope I don't insult you by doing any of the things that I did uh, but I wished that I had at least some of your voice. Because um, as Dr. Downing was saying, it, it's sort of this, you know, uh, I wasn't sure if I was even close to what you had envisioned. And maybe that's okay with you. But it's, I don't want to say it's not okay with me, because whatever you want is okay with me. It's just a matter of, I think, um, I think there could be more, considerably more, to be honest there. Just whether it's expressive markings like Jonathan Embry was talking about earlier, or um, dynamic markings or manual indications or anything, whatever, whatever suits your boat would, I think, help quite a bit. Um, uh, the preface, which we didn't talk about too much, um, I think that for me, as a performer, I wished you had connected the dots for me to understand more about, um, I'm not obsessed with the Fibonacci sequence, you know, I, I, I'm aware of it, but it's not something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. So if you could connect the dots for your performer so that I can see how that compositional structure and how your thought process is going into the composition. Um, obviously, if we had talked, I would have just asked you, uh, but the exercise sort of demanded that um, I knew more than I was able to get from that. So if you could just add more detail about the construction of the piece, that would help, I think, quite a bit. Um, one of the more challenging aspects of the piece, I already sort of said this, is the rhythmic variety. Um, sometimes I really missed uh, downbeats. So if you could go to the phrase where there's, um, where the arpeggios are, uh, where the F is sustained, yeah, right there. Uh, measure 36. Um, I, it's very hard on the organ. One thing that hasn't come up in our discussions today is accents on the organ. We can't accent, we can't accent on the keyboard like you can on a piano. Normally I could just da 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 da, you know, make sure that you're feeling that even though the pitch is sustained. Um, 
it's hot. Like I tried to compensate by giving that that second beat just a little bit more space so that you felt that accent. Um, but I wonder if like maybe a tenuto marking or something, something just so I can feel where the beat is because now I've sustained in measure 35 for four beats and I'm sort of, okay, where is the beat now? I feel it. I, feel, I know what I'm feeling, but can the audience hear that? Um, and I'm not convinced that they can. Um, and then just to echo what Dr. Downing was saying with the Fs, um, even on a large organ like St. Paul's where it's, um, where there is independence. So the pedal in this recording that you're hearing is completely uncoupled. Um, there's no coupling occurring between the hands and the pedal. Um, even with that though, it's still hard to hear the F uh, because it blends, that fundamental tone just blends right into the pedal and it's like it's gone, which makes me again lose those downbeats. So I don't know what the solution is there necessarily, but I just wanted to draw your attention that it sort of um, blends right into the pedal and it's hard to hear that it's part of that line. It almost, it almost sounds like a rest. So that's, um, I really enjoyed getting to know the piece. And I missed the Zimbal Stern too, but I didn't have one, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Great piece, Matthew. Thank you. <laughs> all right, well, we'll wrap it up now. Um, I would just invite all the composers, you should feel free to continue conversations with any of the panelists via email. We'd be happy to talk to you more. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, you can join us as uh, Annie just put in the chat for the virtual concert premiere. It's at 7.30 p.m. tonight. You have a link there for you. Um, the link is also on the page where you registered as well. So it's in a few different places. But if you want to just pop it into your browser window ahead of time, you can go ahead and do that. It will also be available later. So, you know, the, the uh, I guess, positive side of this bizarre time that we're in is that stuff gets pre-recorded. So it will it will be, you know, premiering at 730, but then it's going to live on our YouTube channel and you can definitely tune in whenever it's going to work for you. So uh, thank you all so much. Um, I just want to also just remind the composers that to keep an eye out for our call for scores that's going to come out in March that will be for the competition. Um, we really enjoy getting to know your work and we hope that you will submit something. So everyone have a great evening and we hope to see you at the concert.